Okay, so starting up for our next one, I think that many of you have come here to see Damon. So Damon uh, will be speaking next on self-service operations uh, because failure still happens. Uh, Damon, so many of you know him because he's really one of the luminaries for DevOps and just starting out, what does DevOps mean? How do we all work this? And we know it's still under development. Damon is a co-founder of Rundeck, so scheduling and orchestration platform. Uh, prior to this, he was managing partner at DTO Solutions, uh, where he's looking at DevOps and IT operations management. Um, he spent over 15 years in the industry working both on the technology side as well as the IT side of things. And then he's been really active in growing the international DevOps community. So he's a co-host of a few things you guys are probably aware of, the DevOps Cafe podcast. You guys like that? DevOps, yep. <laughs> as well as uh, an early organizer of DevOps Days. DevOps Days, awesome. And then also uh, he's a content chair for Gene Kim's DevOps Enterprise Summit. So very active. Also, he's the father of a three-year-old girl, and we were just exchanging potty training tips. I have a two-year-old. Uh, and he practices dad ops, which we'll hear about next, in addition to DevOps. Thank you, Damon. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I always get a little embarrassed when someone says the word luminary. As long as it's not charlatan, I'm OK. So um, how many of you are developers, by the way? Okay, all right, that's good. I was, I was concerned. So I have a developer version of this talk, an ops version of this talk, and a boring, like, down the middle talk. So uh, this is the developer version, so good. I'll hopefully be uh, speaking to you. Um, and uh, the talk, I mean, we get to the point of self-service operations, but it's more about how do, how do we, uh, as developers, how does developers help, I say we, I'm more of an on the operations side, how do developers help operations help them, right? Especially in large organizations, uh, you know, ops happens, and we have to, uh, we have to deal with it, and as things start moving faster, how do we um, make it a position where it doesn't come back on the developers, and developers can do what they need to do. So that is the point of this, uh, of this talk. Who I am, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction. Um, but the point is, uh, so today I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Rundeck. Um, we're an orchestration and scheduling tool vendor. Uh, used to be the managing partner of DTO Solutions, which was a uh, kind of specialist uh, DevOps and operations improvement consulting uh, organization for a number of years, also heavily involved in the DevOps community. And the point of all this is, through all this, I get to see a lot of companies. I get to see inside, you know, what works, what doesn't work, uh, from, you know, small kind of high-flying web startups to huge multinational, um, uh, you know, financial services conglomerates. Uh, I get to really kind of dig in and see what's happening, what's not happening, and how they respond to this new desire to go faster and uh, do more with what they, uh, with what they have. So a lot of this talk is about what I've learned through, through that and these design patterns that we're seeing develop. So there's this dream we're all being sold, right? It's in every booth out there, right? It's going to be deploy, 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 deploy. That is the idea. We're going to deploy five times a day, 10 times a day, 1,000 times a day. It's going to be amazing. You just put your headphones in, you lock in, and you're just going to code, hit commit, and life is awesome, right? You know, the reality is there's that, that we still live and work in big, complex organizations, right? That there's multiple parts, there's multiple generations of technologies, multiple APIs we have to deal with. Um, there's a complex world we're in and around us, and operations still happens, right? There's another four-letter word I can put instead of ops there, but, you know, it, it, stuff still, still goes wrong, right? And, you know, it, it's not ops fault, or it's not just ops that gets called into this, right? As developers, too, you know what this is, escalations, the interruptions, the delays, waiting for things, all the context switching you have to do. Oh, I did that last month. Now you're asking me a question about it today. It's finally in production. Like, what, what's that? You know, the bridge calls. Who's been on a bridge call lately? <laughs> yeah? Who really, who really enjoys being on bridge calls? Anybody? No? Right, maybe? Okay. Yeah, the arguments, right? It's, so, this, this, you know, the reality collides into our, into our dream. So I'm going to start with a story kind of that's related to this. Um, anybody ever bought something through Ticketmaster? Yeah, no, this is right. So, uh, twenty-five billion dollars. Uh, good to know booing or hissing. Uh, they're actually great guys, and they they try <laughs> they do a good job. Um, but everybody wants the tickets. Um, so Ticketmaster, it's like twenty-five billion a year in um, in ticket sales globally. Right, it's a huge global operation. Uh, talk about legacy. A huge chunk of that goes through mainframe code that was first checked in in nineteen seventy-six. Right, so. Uh, and they've got all the new high-flying stuff, too. They've got it all, right? A dozen different ticketing systems around the world. It's actually quite an amazing thing to see it, um, see it work. But a few years ago, they realized they have a problem, right? Now, when t 
Chicken Master has a problem. Um, this is not TechCrunch news, right? This is New York Times news. The, Yan the Yankees can't print playoff tickets, right? This is a big deal, right? Uh, people around the world can't get the Riddell tickets. That's on, you know, CNN, CNN Global, right? So they realized that in this complex dance of things that they have to do to, to keep all these fans uh, happy, um, uh, you know, they've, they've realized that their incidents are taking way too long, right? They had an average uh, MTTR, you know, mean time to resolve or repair, uh, 47 minutes for, um, you know, major web, web incidents, right? And if people are already angry because they can't get fast enough to get those Adele tickets, uh, imagine what those, you know, 47 minute outages uh, feel like in that world where they're creating these Black Friday events every time they, uh, they uh, you know, they, they do an on sale. So uh, three folks who fact key in this story, Jody Mulkey, their um, new CTO at the time, Justin Dean, the new head of uh, technical operations, and Mark Mon um, was one of their key uh, system engineers who helped put this, this together. And you know, before the support at the edge program, said 47 minutes, after the support at the edge, the edge program they put into, uh, into place without changing the underlying technology, they got their average mean time to repair from 47 minutes down to 3.8 minutes, right? That's a 90% reduction in MTTR. From a developer perspective, it's a 50% reduction in escalations, right? So half of the time people get interrupted, let's stop, let's stop doing that. And from the business perspective, over half uh, um, reduction in the overall cost of support, right, that they had to, uh, they had to do. So, and this is a uh, story is about a year or so old, so I'm sure they're even better, uh, even better now. So, would you like to know how they, how they did that? But first, <laughs> let's, <laughs> l let's look at the principles behind, behind this improvement, right? Because let's, uh, let's see sort of how it, how it came together. So, first of all, if you think in the industry, right, there's two schools of thought you're gonna see when it comes to, to operations support, right? There's the classic, you build it, they run it, right? Someone's gonna create something, I'm gonna throw it over the wall with some instructions, uh, maybe some scripts, hopefully not some uh, SharePoint documents, but it could be. Uh, I'm gonna throw it over the wall to the operations team and they're going to deploy it, run it, manage it for me and take care of it, right? Then there's this kind of a newer, newer school of thought, right? We call it the you build it, the first one was the you build it, they run it. We call the next one the you build it, you run it. Right? This idea we're going to have integrated development teams, we're going to get delivery teams, we're going to put all the right dev and ops people together um, on those teams, and they're going to crank, and they're going to stay in that same context, and they're going to do the full life cycle, right? Build, release, operate, update, so on, and, and so forth, right? And, you know, I know Amazon's kind of popularized this idea of the two pizza team, right? Which is, hey, you know, we should have these small, tight, integrated teams, um, and no team should be bigger than what can be fed by two uh, large pizzas, right? And if you're a lot of uh, systems administrators, maybe you know they're extra large uh, uh, pizzas, but you get the uh, <laughs> you get you get the idea, right? So, but let's talk about the problems of these, right? There's pros and cons of these. On the uh, you build it, you run it side, uh, the idea that hey, someone else is going to do this stuff for us, right? Isn't that going to be great? We can be rock stars and stay stay focused in on our development, right? But you know what happens, right? Well, it's it's 2 a.m., right? The knock calls, uh, you know, they're uh, they want you to talk them through bringing something back online, right? So you teach them to go through the health checks, looking at log files, the process of diagnosing and then recovering the system. It's the same thing you did for QA uh, or other development teams two months ago. You did it for QA last month. You did it for operations last week. You know you're going to have to do it again. And you finally, you know, it's three, four in the morning. You everything's back online, and you go back to you go back to bed, right? Then you're yeah yeah at the office. You're a little groggy, but you're cranking. You feel good. You're going to get what you had to get done for the day. Phone rings again, it's ops, right? Hey, we're gonna take down EU West, what's that gonna do to your application? Uh, we changed some firewall rules, what do we have to do to your application to make it work? So on and so forth, right? So more interrupts and more interrupts. So the dream of someone else is gonna handle it never really came true because you have all the context that they need anyways. So um, the rest of those teams really become, we call them the escalators, right? It's just something goes wrong, we're gonna draw a box around what it possibly could be, we're gonna escalate off to them. So. It's not really that dream's not really coming, the labor savings isn't really coming, to, uh, coming true. Then there's uh, the other problem is, which is you know, a lot of focus in the DevOps community, if you throw things over the wall to somebody else to run it, you're barely inherently gonna have the handoff problems, the gaps in, in context, and you're gonna have quality problems, right? And then our service blows up, right? <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, that's the other problem with the you build it, they run it. So now let's talk about the you build it, you run it, right? Uh, it's great if I'm a single purpose, you know, kind of startup, right? Um, but what, do, what about in the enterprise, right? Well, what happens all, invariably when 
when companies try to do this, I got this team, they have project-based funding models, right? Not product-based funding models. So things are funded in projects. So I, I just end up with uh, a lot of different services that I'm creating, and these integrated teams, you know, pretty quickly it's like, well, from one quarter to the next, I'm working on new things, I'm building new features over here, I've got an incident for something I did before. You start to get all these different things you have to keep, uh, you have to keep going. The project-based funding goes on and on, and we start to run out of teams, so people get more and more and more services, and uh, eventually it breaks, right? And, you know, this is a, and people say, well, <laughs> this is easy, right? You guys really like that, that fire, <laughs> that fire thing. <laughs> I'm going to use a lot more of that in future, in future presentations. Um, but, you know, the, so everyone says, what, let's just change the business, right? Why don't we just, well, yeah, sure. You know, if you talk about the Amazons, uh, you know, the Netflix of the world, it was a business decision to structure their organization this way, right? So if you can change how your business is structured, funded, and operated, then good on you. I think this is a, a great model to go for. But most large enterprises, it's essentially impossible um, to go to the business and say, we need to change how we're structured, funded, and run in order to make this model, this model work, right? So how do we get the best of both, uh, of both of these models, right? Uh, we want the labor scaling benefit of the you build it, they run it model, right? But we want it without the frequent escalations and without the bad handoffs, right? Those breaks in, in context. Uh, I want the responsiveness and control of the you build it, you run it uh, uh, model, but without the scaling limitations, right? So self-service self operations is this uh, name we've given to this design pattern that we've seen pop up in the community. Um, it was there in the Ticketmaster story. Uh, we see it in Equifax and other places as well that are you know, you know, talking about this, how do you straddle the old and the new in a large, a large enterprise. And it's basically the idea of how do we address um, those places where the handoffs need to happen between, between, between different parts of the organization. And the key idea, um, you know, if you think about how automation used to work, it was you know, operations job to define it, to execute it, to have all the security and management and auditing and control over it. What's interesting about the design pattern is these companies have taken those kind of three essential parts, you know, the definition of the automation, the ability to execute the automation, and all the management security control of the automation, and they've split it up into different pieces that can be moved to where they're best used, and where they can best exploit the, the, you know, the workforce capacity or the labor capacity in their organization. So kind of cartoonishly, it ends up looking like this, right? To say, well, you know, on one side here, we have uh, the gap, we have the producers, people who make something that somebody else, or do something that somebody else needs. In this case, we're probably talking about ops, right? On the other side, we've got the consumers, right? The people, the developers that need ops to do something, something for them, right? So uh, what they end up doing is saying, well, let's, t again, think about that definition, execution, management control, right? Well, let's allow... Um, in most cases, let's, ha let's allow the producers to uh, define the automation policy, operations define the automation policy. Let's give the consumers, uh, the, the development teams, the ability to execute that automation, right? And then let's have another operations or security team keep kind of watch over, well, who can run that stuff or, or what? And then it's like, well, wait a minute, why we're, we're, we have this capacity problem in operations having to write these procedures for things that somebody else develops. Why not give them to that to them too? So let's let the developers write those, those, those define those, those automated procedures, um, hand it off to operations who can vet it, then turn around and give the execution back uh, to um, development if they want, or give the execution to internal kind of operations support teams, right? So they can kind of play with that mix of those three controls and have a common place to collaborate, def to, to collaborate on defining, executing, and controlling those, uh, that automation. And then they move that kind of toggle back and forth based on uh, what they're trying to do. Is it for the new web stuff? Is it for the old legacy stuff? Um, you know, where do we have the most labor capacity to, to spare, right? So that's kind of the core idea. So, you know, you're like, okay, it's great for operations, but what do developers get out of this, right? Developers in the room. Number one, it's this reduced escalation and, and quicker resolutions, right? You hate getting interrupted. I mean, think about Agile, Kanban, you know, Scrum, all these things. What's the whole point? Not being interrupted, right? You set up your whole world to lock in and not be interrupted by, uh, or have too many things going on at once and not be interrupted by other, other things, right? It's like one of the core ideas of uh, all this Agile stuff they've been talking about for the last, last decade. So all this operations work coming your way is just going to interrupt things, uh, you know, things more. So the old model, it's like, well, we're going to have this, you know, sort of some network op or some operations team 
They're essentially what we call the escalators, right? Something goes wrong, they gotta find the right people, and they're gonna say, what's wrong with your service? What's wrong with your service? Your job is to log in and, and, and say, not me, and get back to your, other, uh, to your other work, right? So by the time something actually you know, transpires that you need to look at in operations, you're too busy, you're too late, right? And you're always behind the, uh, behind the gun. In this newer model, if we're able to have, um, you know, use a self-service operations idea to have these uh, you know, predefined pre procedures to move that labor to where it's best, it's best utilized, you can keep a lot of those escalations off of your level, you know, layer two and uh, level two and level three support people, right? The specialists, the, um, uh, you know, the developers, help them define those procedures, move, let the operators be operators. It takes a lot of the, uh, the pressure off of, uh, off of, uh, off of the uh, developers, right? Also, it gets you tighter feedback loops, right? And the whole DevOps movement is all about saying, how can we you know, make these faster feedback loops between development and operations? If you're, as a developer, have part in defining these procedures, you can run them, you can see them being run, you're much tighter integrated to the operations uh, process, you get better feedback, which helps you create you know, better systems, which improves operational performance in the future, which means less interruptions for you as well, right? Um, and also, uh, this may not make as much sense without talking about what I want to talk about later, but you know, it, it, this self-service operations um, um, uh, design pattern really helps change the mindset of operations managers, right? In the old mindset, it, when they're the ones that have to do all of, all of the work, their whole job is around, or most of their job, is around protecting capacity, right? We don't have enough people, we've got too many tickets flying our way, so it's all about protecting capacity and saying no, right? Uh, get the hot potatoes off our plate and don't let any more, any more in. If they have the team focused on building these self-service operations capabilities where they can relieve some of that pressure, uh, the mindset turns into more of a service provider. Hey, how do we scale this service we've created? How do we get more users to use the service we created? So they're thinking more about how am I more useful to you, the consumers of my service, than they are about the bunker uh, you know, mentality. It's really an interesting shift. Um, that uh, developers will find much more friendly than the uh, kind of traditional ops, you know, um, go away uh, attitude, right? So how can, uh, how, can de how can developers help operations make this a reality, right? Uh, how can you help them get involved with this? So first we want to understand, you know, the pain of operations today, right? I think you've got to walk a mile in their shoes to understand what's what's going on. First, operations is in this kind of horrible squeeze. And you know, there's a lot of pride in, uh, in the operations world that they don't want to admit this is going on. But if you think about all this DevOps, uh, you know, digital transformations, it's all about going faster, opening things up, go, 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 right? And this is coming from the highest levels. The business is, 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 is pounding this, uh, or is beating this drum. Right? But then on the other side, they have all the traditional operations concerns. It's, it's be more secure, be more reliable, don't be the next hack, don't be the next breach, lock things down. This is, you know, you know keep us off of uh, you know, CNBC, right? So they're, and ops is in the middle of all this. They're getting, they're getting squeezed. It's often the same business folks that are making these pressures kind of on both of these sides, right? And ops is the place where they have to, uh, have to handle that, and the traditional uh, you know, procedures aren't, 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 uh, aren't scaling. And at the same time, it's always the classic on ops, like, you know, spend less, do more, right? The cost pressure um, is squeezing as well. So ops is in this tough position of getting squeezed. So anything you can do to talk to helping relieve that squeeze is, uh, is going to go a long, a long ways. If whatever you're suggesting is going to make that squeeze worse, you know, you don't, have a, you don't have a prayer. Which is why a lot of times, you know, the ops, the kind of core enterprise operations resistance to these DevOps and agile and digital transformation ideas is, is Quite resistant uh, because they're afraid of that of that of that of that squeeze. And think about ops too. Again, I talked about development that you know you've done all these things over the last decade to lock out change and to limit work in progress and, and you know and focus. Uh, ops is unplanned and planned work by design, right? So um, you have to take that into account. And we already you know we've already talked about on the development side how toxic um, you know this unplanned work is, but they accept it by. Uh, by default, and have to layer it in with, um, you know, with with uh, with planned work, right? Maybe not at an individual level all the time, but definitely at the organizational level, you got to manage both. And we know how expensive context switching is, right? This is why we want to lock out all those changes in the agile world, right? Um, there's a guy named uh, Gerald Weinberg, um, who uh, Jeff Atwood, uh, the coding whore, um, whores, uh, whore guy, H O R R. Uh, he, um, <laughs> to be clear, <laughs> he. Uh, there's a code of conduct somewhere. He, uh, 
he, 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 he's, he's kind of broken down some of his work and made it digestible. Talks about the cost of context switching. That you, you know, they think it's, it's 20 plus percent uh, loss of productivity for every uh, additional project you add to somebody's, uh, to somebody's workload to the point where the context switching is actually more of your cognitive power than actually doing, doing the work, right? So it's very, so Ops is dealing with this. Ops is dealing with, you know, crushing technical debt. Uh, this is actually a real healthcare provider. I mean, talking about, you know, just to get changes done, right? They got 900 developers, 500 people in QA and app support, 200 in operations. Um, you know, they got all these other things they bought in the past, billing, pharmacy, pa care, patient care, government services, right? And to make a significant change, I think it was just to allow people to see their bills in different regions of uh, where they're working. Um, this is all the pieces they had to touch, right? Just to get a change done, because it had to go through the new UI, the old UI, the mobile teams, they had to talk to the back-end mainframe folks, they had to get the operations people on board, they had different operations for different markets, because different customers wanted different things, right? And this is the life in the operations. It's probably like, if you take like, go and talk to Cisco folks, go talk to, you know, the folks at Cisco WebEx, versus a new, you know, sort of a chat streaming startup you talk to, it's just, it's two different worlds, right? So be aware of that, of that technical debt. Um, silos are the other thing that ops is, uh, you know, is, is deals with and, and we all have to deal with actually. And, you know, silos aren't just we have different teams, but it's the break in context, right? So the idea that I'm in my group and we have a shared context and we have a common work queue, right? That's our silo. And the other, uh, somebody else, they have a different context and a different work queue, right? And that's their silo. Maybe there's multiple, even multiple teams in that, in that, um, in those silos, but generally they're, you know, single team or, um, you know, kind of one group. And the problem with these silos is now we're, is we have these breaks in the context where work has to pass from one to the other, right? So this is very much the classic DevOps, uh, you know, type problem where devs working in their context, ops working in their context, and, um, you know, this is where we have these feedback and handoff problems. Operations is generally a whole big series of these, right? So they've got networking silos, which I'm sure you all know, know about, right? They've got, you know, they've got uh, servers, they've got storage, they've got the new cloud teams, right? They've got the network operations teams, uh, they've got the firewall teams, they've got everybody, right? So silos everywhere, let alone the silos of dealing with the different delivery teams. And so, you know, we're often told, oh, well, just cross-functional teams, right? This idea pops up again where we're going to, um, you know, just uh, layer in all the people that we need on these teams and divide it up in sort of these, these uh, cross-functional groups. But the problem is it's never enough, right? Especially imagine that, remember that big picture of the crushing technical debt in, uh, in the enterprise. There's, there's never going to be enough of these cross-functional teams to go around. You're never going to have enough network specialists or enough DBAs or enough security, uh, you know, security engineers to go around everywhere. So you're going to always have these, uh, these other silos that, ha that work has to jump from one silo to their silo and get done and then come back. And that's one of the key points of the, of the, of the self-service operations design pattern is that how can they let these cross-functional teams in the new model um, you know, get all the goodness that they need from this specialist team without having to actually hand the work off to them? How do I make it something where I can pull it as needed and it doesn't get in my way of these, um, of these teams? So one more thing about operations um, that I think you have to understand, that the silos way of working plus this evolution of new tools means that we're always going to have what we call these islands of automation. We see it everywhere, right? Um, you know, you're going to have Ansible, Puppet, Chef. You're going to have PowerShell scripts. You're going to have old shell scripts. You're going to have legacy automation tools sitting right next to your brand new fancy tools, right? You're going to have all the new container stuff. Um, and these things are erupting all the time. I mean. You talked three years ago, you know, Chef and Puppet were the hottest thing in town, right? Now in a lot of organizations, it sounds funny, but it's, it's almost legacy, right? I mean, it's, it's the new advanced project team that was making that stuff happen uh, three years ago. They're on to the new Kubernetes, Docker, 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 uh, you know, <laughs> and Chef and Puppet have moved on to the, the, the core group and they got to figure out, well, how do I deal with this, right? And so every three, five years, you're going to have a new wave of tools, a new wave of things happening, and ops has to deal with all of that, right? So, you know, that's something to keep in mind that islands of automation are reality. You have to embrace that and help them, help them deal with that. Not expect that we're going to have one tool to rule them all. If they just saw it was better, then they should change everything they do. You just can't do it. Again, that crushing technical debt, silos, all of those things. So we want to embrace, embrace that. So from the ops perspective, 
the stuff we just talked about, squeezed between competing pressures, planned and unplanned work, silos are everywhere, crushing technical debt, islands of automation, means they have no time for anything, right? They don't, there's never enough people, there's never enough time. This is you know, the, the, the pain of the people that you're gonna be going out and talking to and saying that you want them to do something, something different, right? So how developers can help operations, right? Number one, recognize that great operations starts in development, right? You guys heard that expression that abs, you know, like you know, your abs aren't made in the gym, they're made in the kitchen, right? This is, this is that same idea, <laughs> right? That, <laughs> you know, I can exercise all I want, I probably should do a lot more, but if I, you know, keep eating, you know, keep eating pizza, it's just not, you know, what's, what's, what's the point, right? Uh, so as developers, you need to take that on and realize that, hey, you know, that we, it's our responsibility. And, and um, you know, uh, um, in doing that, we have to develop with this operable first mindset, right? And um, I'm gonna kind of blow through this, it's like a whole other presentation, I'll blow through it kind of quickly. Number one, realize that operations is the business, right? Unless you literally sell package software, right? You are not in the software business. Your company does not get paid to write software. You get paid to run and deliver services. So operations is, by definition, the business. We have to keep that in our, in our minds, that everything we have to do, the operability of it is, is key, right? The deployability, the configurability, the monitoring, they're all features of the service. Without them, the service does not work. The service doesn't work. We're out of business, so the service has to work. It's as, there's all first-class features as important as any business function that you're gonna be, um, that you're gonna be developing, because the service is the business, right? You know, build configurability into the service. Don't externalize it. Don't say, well, we'll have to have a configuration file, or well, if you just use this, you know, this, this framework to do X, Y, and Z, then you can configure this thing. The configurability um, and the monitoring and the deployability are all part of your service. Build the configurability into the service. Give them another page to configure it through there. Give them an API to configure it. Don't externalize it and make it operations problem. Um, you know, demand prod-like environments everywhere, right? The ability to say, you know, as developers, you really hear developers, you hear operations pushing for, oh, I want to, you know, this kind of the more aware operations organizations will try to push and say, hey, I want to get developers developing against prod-like, may not be exactly prod, but limit the, the number of differences between production and um, uh, these development and testing environments. Um, but the reality is, Development should be demanding that. Because again, if you're concerned about the deployability, the configurability, the operability, all that matters is what happens when this thing runs in production. So why aren't we developing against as production-like environments uh, uh, um, uh, as possible and making sure that all of the deployability, configurability, the monitorability, all that stuff is working as early as possible in those environments, not wait for it to happen um, some, other, some other place. Um, make sure that handoffs and teams are verification-driven. Again, they don't have time to, you know, catch these Word documents with do this, then do that, or if you check this log file and, you know, and, and look for, uh, you know, for it to be two dots, not three dots, then you know that this, you know, this thing is, 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 functioning, is functioning properly. You know, try to make this as test-driven as possible, that, hey, run this, run this script to see if it works, and, uh, to, to, to make it run, uh, press this button to, you know, to see if it's functioning, if it's functioning properly. Um, build that verification into what you, what you do. Um, this is really getting in the weeds. Create immutable version artifacts, new standard packaging, right? Uh, the container, the Docker, whether it's the Docker containers or we're talking about RPMs, uh, come up with a consistent way to distribute and package um, and, uh, you know, build something once and then configure it uh, for, different, for different environments. Um, and uh, last one, which developers always kind of groan about, but, you know, integration tests over, over unit tests, right? From a developer perspective, unit tests are king, right? Th but that's for you. That's for you to do your job better. Uh, integration tests are what matter to the rest of the organization, including operations, right? Because for them, it's, is this service running? Is this service healthy? That is the single most important test. And often those are the tests that we always forget about until I'll write those in the end because you're busy you know, function, worrying about the unit tests. So unit tests are incredibly important, but that's for your own craft. It's for your own team. It's for your own use. What matters to the organization, what matters to operations, is the integration, you know, black box style style tests to know is this thing working with the things it needs to work with, and is this thing healthy and happy? And there's any test you're going to have to the rest of the organization, not to you, the rest of the organization. That is, you know, the test that um, the test that that matters, right? And so in that, you know, we, the reason why we want this operable first mentality is to shift left. Have you heard this term before? This is kind of big in the DevOps world. Let's shift left as much of that operations activity as possible. And in you know, the kind of common way, a lot of people talk about, well, there's the deployment type activity, right? There's the automated tests, deployment automation, you know, security scanning. We can pull that forward. 
But also think about how do we run this stuff post post uh, deployment, right? So you know, automated runbooks, monitoring metrics, you know, operational control. How do we pull all that as as uh, as far left as possible and solve those problems in development when they're cheapest and easiest to solve? You solve those in development, you won't get woken up as much. The life cycle will move faster. You'll see what you're doing uh, come out in production uh, a lot quicker. You'll have much 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 tighter feedback loops, and you'll be a lot happier. Uh, kind of fourth thing you can do is, all right, taking these mindset, take these ideas, start to develop these you know, self-service operations capabilities. And how we've seen it come about is you have generally this kind of multi-step process here. The first thing we see people do is establishing some kind of secure operations hub, right, or something called an operations portal. It has really two elements, right? One is the activity and health view. How do I know this, this environment or this uh, service is healthy? What, how do I know what the configuration is? Uh, make that visible where people can see it. Um, you know, being from, from Rundeck, we see this a lot where people use Rundeck, either the open source or the, uh, or the uh, uh, pro version, as, you know, the centralized place to define those automated procedures, right? Um, it allows them to uh, say, these are my standard operating procedures, and then define the security policies and the data policies for those, those procedures. And then with that, they can say, well, now I'm going to start to let different operations team use these standard operating procedures, makes them more effective and efficient. I'm going to start to let different engineers uh, give them some limited self-service access. Maybe they can run anything in the pre-prod, but in production, they can only do this kind of safe restart and a, uh, um <coughs> a, uh, some kind of deep you know, status command, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And then you know, down below here, at all times, security and operations manage access. They manage um, you know, configuration, compliance, uh, all, that, all that good stuff. They stay in control. Again, we were able to. To ha now we have the ability to def move execution and control where we need it. But the next part I always come to is, well, how do we make the definition part better? How do we get all that stuff into this, this portal? If we still have to rely on operations to set it all up, we're just going to run into that capacity crunch again. So taking the same SDLC-driven approach that we're seeing kind of very, you know, very popularized uh, with infrastructure as code and the whole DevOps movement, uh, do the same thing for your monitoring and uh, setup and your automated uh, procedures, right? So Put them in a you know in a, uh, a source repository. Do code reviews where security and uh, operations and development can look at it and say, yeah, this looks this looks good. Thumbs up, thumbs down, and then promote it uh, when ready into uh, that common place. Then they always get to, well, hey, we got all this other information. We got all these tickets right everywhere. Uh, how do we get that information integrated? Other monitoring, this new kind of software supply chain ideas of you know where these artifacts, the control of the artifacts, that can be uh, you know folded in as well. And by doing this, they're able to sort of orchestrate and take uh, most of the operational um, uh, activity in the organization, break it up into those different pieces, and move it to the pe people that need to that need to see it. Makes compliance happy because now you've got the who, what, when, where, everything, the audit trail. Um, it's great. So you know, those are kind of the four things that developers can do to help operations. Back to our Ticketmaster story, so I only got a couple minutes. Um, what they did, uh, right, uh, again, didn't change the underlying technology. Number one, they came up with this, the idea to say, let's have the uh, automated ops procedures. We've got a standard vocabulary. Let's let uh, these be written and vetted by the delivery teams and handed off to operations. Ops would accept them, maintain full control over what can run and the security policy. They empowered the NOC team to no longer be escalators, but actually start to take on support tasks. They embedded a lot of these tasks into their monitoring tools. So when you get a monitoring alert, no longer did it, it you have to look in a book and figure out who to call, but actually gave them links to their, um, uh, you know, to the automated procedures to, to, uh, you know, to resolve the, the incident, especially the known ones they already, they already knew about. Um, and they, you know, empower developers these limited self-service operations to some teams are doing deployments, other teams is just take, to take part in, in remediation, but they're able to move that around. And then they came up with a new incident response and escalation model um, to kind of help wrap this and fit this into their, into their culture. And, you know, that's the kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts of what they uh, did. I'd be happy to talk about it uh, more in depth. Uh, afterwards, um, but again, it wasn't an underlying technology change, it was a change in the process and, and the supporting tooling, and I think it was about 18 months or so, I could be wrong about, about that between these two, uh, from 47 minutes to 3.8 minutes. So here's my talk in one slide, probably could have just showed this, um, but remember, you know, understand the pressure on operations, right? Understand the, the operating model that you're in and the pros and cons, develop that operable first mentality amongst you and your development peers. Shift left as many of those concerns. It's not, it sounds like more work in the short term on you, but it, trust me, you're actually making your world and the entire organization better, and your life will be much happier. 
um, you know, apply that self-service design pattern, um, operation design pattern wherever you can, not just in the sort of dev and ops, but maybe between, you know, DBAs, network engineers, um, and the rest of the teams, anywhere you have a specialist activity and you want to, want to scale it, uh, we see it be a very popular thing to do. And make that explicit investment in the process and tooling to make it happen. Don't just expect this to happen on its own, but look at it as a formal project and a formal thing you want to, uh, you want to do. And um, that's my talk. Uh, if you want to talk to me, uh, I'm Damon at rundeck.com or at Damon Edwards if uh, Twitter is your thing. I'll also be here. Uh, thank you very much to the DevNet crew for having me, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.